Hey guys, today we're going to talk about the Paul Reed Smith McCarty 594. Now, if you're a Paul Reed Smith fan, you know what this guitar is. It was leaked on Facebook or Twitter by John Mayer or Periscope, actually. I think it was John Mayer. And uh, it's very exciting and new for them. Now, if you're not a Paul Reed Smith fan and you're just learning about Paul Reed Smith guitars, sometimes the word McCarty gets confusing. Here's why. First of all, they're talking about Ted McCarty. Ted McCarty ran Gibson. And more importantly, with this quick search on Google, you will find out that Ted was also a mentor to Paul Reed Smith. Paul Reed Smith sought out Ted and had him kind of mentor him. It gets confusing because sometimes you'll see like Custom 24 with a McCarty finish, but then you'll see a guitar called a McCarty. But then you'll see another guitar called a McCarty, but it looks totally different. Here's what I do for myself, for my own sanity. Whenever Paul Reed Smith, and this is unofficial and not attached to Paul Reed Smith anyway, that's my full disclaimer. Whenever I see the word McCarty, I just think Gibson. So if somebody says it's a Paul Reed Smith with a McCarty finish, it just means it's gonna be a Gibson-esque finish. If it's a McCarty style guitar, it means the guitar will be leaning towards the Gibson style, which maybe is lacquer body, or thicker body, or binding, or whatever it is, but, or thicker neck, it'll just be more Gibsonized. Now again, that's not official, and that's just my own interpretation, but trust me, I really feel if you just start noticing every time you see the word McCarty mixed with Paul Reed Smith, it just means it's gonna have a more Gibson-esque feel or look to it. Now the McCarty 594 shares a lot of typical features with a standard PRS guitar. They both are double cutaways, rosewood fretboard, bird inlays, and both use the typical kind of phase three tuning keys, locking tuning keys by Paul Reed Smith. But after that, it starts departing really quickly. The next feature that changes is it's a thicker body. You can tell right here how much thicker they made the body. Maybe the theory was more mass, more tone, but really we know with the my previous disclosed comment that basically the McCarty is trying to be a more Gibson feeling type instrument. That's why you'll notice the binding, kind of like that guitar, and of course a bow nut. The neck has a new carve. The carve is basically called a vintage pattern. It's not quite a pattern regular or a pattern thin. It's not as thin or thick as their normal necks. It's something in the middle and it is noticeable when you play it that it feels oddly comfortable. In fact, um, I can't even place where I kind of detect this neck from, but it is very familiar. It almost feels like home when I touch it. <laughs> Now they added a three-way switch. The three-way switch is very reminiscent of Gibson because it puts it up in the upper horn like a Les Paul would be and takes it away from that blade switch that they've been using for the last few years. They added four knobs, two volumes and two tones, again, to be more familiar with maybe what the Gibson players uh, used to. And then of course, added coil split switches underneath the tone controls to give you the kind of Strat feature. <laughs> Now another unique feature on this guitar is the pickups. They're the 5815s LT. One thing I noticed about this guitar is different is that even in a Custom 22 or their single cut Paul Smith where the neck pickup is placed further away from the bridge point. In other words, it's closer up on the fretboard, right? where you get a warmer tone, it still never nailed the Gibson Les Paul neck pickup. In fact, my personal opinion for whatever it's worth is this. I always thought Paul Reed Smith Custom 24 and 22s, or single cuts for that matter, the bridge pickup always beats the Les Paul because it has more mids. It just seems to be more involved where the Les Pauls always have been thin in the bridge. But the Les Paul neck is the magic and Paul Reed Smith has never been able to kind of nail that. And this guitar does it. Check this out. Now, even though the tone on the neck pickup is really thick, they can actually thin it down by using a coil split. Now, the Les Paul does kind of the same job. I've owned many Les Pauls, and when you coil split them, they tend to do the same thing. Although, this Paul Reed Smith nails a little bit more closer to the Fender sound as well. I'm sure it has something to do with the way they wired it. <laughs> Now another thing that makes this guitar interesting is they change the scale length. This guitar is not the same distance as a Les Paul. It's 24 and a half. 
basically, inches long, instead of 24 and three quarters. It's actually shorter scale than a Gibson Les Paul. The idea was to give you kind of more fluent bending, uh, easier kind of vibrato on the guitar by shortening the scale. The strings will get a little bit more slack to get to the same pitch. Also, you can do on this guitar, this guitar has hybrids. It starts out tens and ends at, a, at, a, at an 11 gauge set. So it's pretty thick on the end and it sounds fantastic, but yet I feel I have total control. Um, I wasn't quite sure what I thought. I, I thought about the scale length when I first started playing it, but then I kept going back and forth with my Les Paul and I kind of noticed it kind of has a little bit more something in, in it that I liked it over my Les Paul. Another critique I have about this guitar is I wish they would have done the 12 inch radius. This is a 10 inch radius, like a typical Paul Reed Smith, which I actually appreciate. I like that radius a lot. However, there's something about the Les Paul having that 12 inch flat fretboard radius that was kind of cool. And this guitar, when I kind of was playing it, I feel immersed kind of in a Les Paul vibe, but with something kind of with the Paul Reed Smith kind of quality added to it. And yet, I would have thought that fretboard would have really cinched the deal. I wish it was a 12 inch radius fretboard. That would have been cool. Um, I, maybe it was too over the top to go that way and just too Gibson-y to be that way, but I would have thought, you know what, at this point, let's just go Hall's Balls and go for it. Now, of course, Paul Reed Smith pays attention to the details. They've actually changed the uh, the signature this year. They actually made the signature so it's legible. You can actually read it now, uh, Paul Reed Smith. I don't know if I really care about that. I get the idea when I see the signature. Um, the fact that it's now more easily read is nothing really that I concern myself with. But, you know, I understand that they're trying to always make efforts to improve the product. So. And you know, accolade for giving an effort. I just don't really feel that it really mattered to me. What does matter to me is though how the pickup sounds. This uh, this this pickup in the bridge, it just has a great tone. Now I have a 5708 in one of my uh, PRSs. I have the 5909s, and um, and I have the 5815s. And this 5815 LT bridge just has something. Check this out. <laughs> See, very impressive kind of sound, you know, right? Full, sustain, kind of has a, you know, a, a big, bold mid-range to it. And it sounds great when single coil mode, check that out. One of the things I thought about when I was checking this guitar out was with a shorter scale, how would it take drop tuning? Let's say a half step down, or maybe even taking your E a full step down to a drop D. And I know you're probably not gonna pay metal on it, but still a drop D is a really common phrase for all kinds of music. So even though um, you know you, the shorter scale could affect that, what I noticed was, cause it has a thicker string on it, it actually sounds really good. It's got a, a little bit of sludgy, but really defined still, which is really nice. Check out this uh, take with a little bit more distorted in the drop D setting. So what's my take on this? Well, I've played a lot of Paul Reed Smiths over the years, and I've owned a lot of Paul Reed Smiths over the years, and I will say this, this Paul Reed Smith is different. I've actually owned the SE245, and that was a great guitar, but this guitar adds something, something I can't really explain. There's something to it that actually has got it closer to that kind of Gibson thick tone that I always felt like Paul Reed Smith has its own kind of sound, but it's really mids and it sounds great because it's got, you know, push and power, but it always lacked kind of that intimate warmth, you know? <laughs> And now I really feel it has it. This guitar does a very good job. It's pretty expensive. It's gonna run you about $3,600 for this guitar American. This guitar is actually 42 because it has a 10 top. If you're not familiar with the 10 top and how that works, essentially there's a lot of ways to explain it, but the way I love to explain it is this. They go through and they pick you out a pretty top. <laughs> okay. 
okay? That's what that means, you know, right? There's some, some, some policies and procedures they follow to make sure that it happens, but let's be honest. Um, I own two Paul Ray Smith Custom 24s, 110, non 10, and most people can't figure out which one's different. So you can luck of the draw, get a top that's really pretty without it being 10 top. Although you can see from this top, it is absolutely gorgeous. I mean, this guitar is just phenomenal, gorgeous in every way. I think it is, is exactly what you think it is. It's a guitar that they're trying to use to appeal to maybe a player that has liked the quality of Paul Reed Smith, but maybe not felt that there was a mojo to it. This guitar definitely has more of that vintage kind of mojo. In fact, here's my last tidbit for whatever it's worth. I feel like if Gibson was to keep evolving, they would end up with something like this. It feels like something that if you were listening to customers, eventually the feedback would take you here. In other words, give me the guitar that I love, the binding, right, uh, the, the bone nut, the locking keys, you know, the bridge, the way it is, but maybe give me some other features. This horn, I don't really know if it, it's something that Gibson would ever care to do. I mean, they obviously have a dual cut uh, guitar in the Gibson lineup, but this guitar is definitely somebody looking at a Gibson Les Paul and saying, hey, is, there's room for improvement. What could we do? And I think they did it. This guitar definitely has that. And I can see why a player like John Mayer would have played it and gravitated towards it because it, you could tell he, he likes a modern guitars and vintage guitars. And that's what this is kind of doing. <laughs> Love it, it's a great guitar. So as always, if you like what you see here and you'd like to see more, please subscribe. If you like this video, please hit like and share it because that always helps the channel grow, which is very nice. And I appreciate all of you who have stood behind the channel since we started. It's been growing at a great pace and it, it really uh, makes me feel really good to know that these videos are being seen by people and it's, uh, and it's cool to share gear uh, information with other, each other. And as always, thank you for your time and know your gear.